Great to be with you this morning. Happy Friday. Hopefully you're looking forward to the weekend. Hopefully a little downtime. Uh, but this morning I'm excited to share with you uh, the next desire in our series uh, called Desire. This year in chapel, hopefully this is not the first time you are here, at least not as a student. If so, you are way behind in your chapel credits. But we are talking about uh, the seven deepest desires of the human heart. The seven deepest desires of, of your heart. And here's why this topic is, is so critically important. See, most of us assume that, that in order to please God, you need to suppress these desires or maybe even repent of these desires, turn away from them, deny them at all costs. And yet the scripture teaches us time and time again that these desires were given to us by God. They teach us so much more about God and they actually are the very things that will draw us closer to God. God. You see, God doesn't want to just save us, but he promises to actually satisfy us. You with me? And that's what we've been looking at so far this semester. Here are the seven different desires. And my hope is that over the course of the last month or so, you have, you have seen how the promise of Psalm 37, 4, that he will grant you the desires of your heart, you will satisfy the desires of your heart. I hope that you have seen how that is true as it pertains to our desire for fascination. Our God is wonderful. Literally meaning he is full of wonder. And his hope is that he would blow your mind and fill your heart with amazement day after day after day. And I enjoyed this last month as we looked at how maybe, maybe you're fascinated by the life and ministry of Jesus. Maybe you are fascinated by the fact that the God who knows all things knows you by name. Maybe you're fascinated by the invitation to go on behalf of God out into the furthest corners of the world and to spread his light and his love in those places. Maybe you're fascinated by the, by the crazy wonders that are deep in the ocean. Maybe you are fascinated by, by the amazing ability we have to uncover and literally unearth things in this earth that help us understand the biblical narrative more fully Maybe you are fascinated by any number of things, but I hope that you are somehow and in some way inspired, intrigued, left in awe this last month by a fascinating God who invites us to do fascinating things with him. And this morning, we're going to enter into the second desire. That's kind of how it's going to work throughout the course of the year. The beginning of each month, I'll come and I'll introduce the newest desire, and in the next three or four weeks, we'll dive more fully into it. You with me? All right. Uh, any, any Lady Gaga fans in here? By chance, any Gagas? Okay, I don't know what you call a Gaga fan, Gaga Florian. I don't even know. Okay, a few years ago though, she came out with a song called Applause. Anybody know the song? I'll, I'll sing it for you just in case you don't really know. I live for the applause, applause, applause. I live for the applause, applause. Live for the applause, applause. <laughs> thank you, thank you. I want to thank. I want to thank you, Kevin. Thank you, thank you. Don't clap. That was horrible. Now the the. The lyrics of that song, they are not profound, right, by any stretch of the imagination, but they do perfectly describe our next desire. And it's a desire that I really resonate with, maybe more than all of the others. If you know anything about me, you know that I'm what some people might call a little competitive, uh, meaning that I hate losing with every fiber of my being. And that, that includes everything, right, from board games to the board room, and I hate losing. When I was little, I would literally cry and throw a tantrum every time I struck out in baseball. Uh, speaking of throwing things, I would throw the remote control of the Xbox across the room if I was about to lose. Or I would turn the system off in an angry tirade right before my perfect season was about to come to an end. Uh, one time, I spanked myself so profusely with a ping pong paddle after losing to my best friend that I broke the paddle in half and nearly broke the friendship. That, that's just, this is your campus pastor, okay? It's confession time. Here we go. And then, uh, then there is Stacker. Anybody familiar with this little arcade game? Stacker? Well, I nearly lost my salvation the day I played this stupid game. Or maybe I, I came close to spending time behind bars the day that I played this game. I was at the movie theater. And I made it to the top level of this game, right? In this game, little blocks go flying across the screen, and you got to stop them, and you stack them up, hence the name, right? Real creative. Well, I got to the last level five times in a row, and when you do, the game starts to go berserk, right? It's kind of like a little casino in Vegas, like beep, 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 beep. 
So a crowd, I kid you not, a crowd starts forming around Stacker. It's like, oh yeah, watch this, watch this. Here we go, Stacker, Stacker, Stacker. Okay, again, right? Five more dollars. Five times in a row. Five times in a row. The iPad, which is right there for the taking, it was mine. It was in my grasp. And then when I lost for the sixth time, I kid you not, I nearly punched my fist through that screen and grabbed the iPad out. You would have not thought I was a pastor at the time, let alone a Christian, right? But I mean, it's crazy. I, I, I want to be the best at everything. I want to win at everything. It could be sports. It could be hobbies. It could be professional pursuits. I don't want a good ministry. I want the biggest ministry. I don't want to just be a good speaker. I want to be the man when it comes to speaking. Does anybody relate to this desire? It's the desire for greatness. Uh, this is so embarrassing, and I have to do it because I lost a bet, but this right here is my high school letterman jacket, okay? Take this jacket as an example of my desire for greatness, right? This is basically an overpriced jacket, piece of leather with pompous, pretentious patches all over it, right? Uh, great at this, great at that. On the back, you will see, just because in case you wanted to know, here's my last name, and it says student body president. So my junior year, I decided to run for student body president because why not? Actually, it was my sophomore year. There was no rule against underclassmen running. So I ran and I won. Eat that, seniors, right? <laughs> and and just, so, just so you know, I was so excited about that, I put this little patch on there, first ever junior student body president. <laughs> Turns out, the first year the school was open, there was a junior student body president. So that wasn't even true. But I was so arrogant, right? I was so, so enamored by the applause of the world. And I wanted people to think that I was great. Maybe you can relate. Maybe you can relate to this desire. This is the desire to be the best, to get the trophy, to be crowned the king, to be carried out of the room on people's shoulders as they're screaming your name, right? Moana, 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 you're amazing. Right? That's, that, that's this desire. This is the desire you have to not only play the game, but to crush your opponent while you're playing the game. This is the desire you have to not only learn a new skill, but to master it instantly and to be the best at that new skill. This is the desire you have to not only be a great student, but be the best student in your class, to get the best grade in the class, but then also to be the valedictorian of your class. This is the desire you have to not only decorate your dorm room, but to decorate it so much so that your friends take pictures of it, post it on Pinterest, and then you win an award called Dress Up, Dress Up. Right? I mean, this is the desire we have to be the best. Lady Gaga said it well, didn't she? We live for the applause. The applause, applause, applause. Right? We live for the applause. Now, if you doubt that you are driven by this particular desire, just wait until somebody else receives the credit. Maybe the credit that you thought you deserved. If you doubt that you are driven by this particular desire, just, just wait until that promotion or, or that, that job or that, that, that standing ovation goes to somebody else, and then you will see just how deep this desire goes. We all have it. We all want to be great. The question is why? Why do we want to be the best? Why do we want to stand out? Why do we want other people to stand in awe of us? Well, I think the answer is found on nearly every page of Scripture. You don't have to look very far to figure out why you want to be great. Let me read a couple of these for you this morning. The first is 1 Chronicles 16. For great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. He is to be feared above all gods. For all the gods of the nations are idols, but the Lord made the heavens. Splendor and majesty are before him. Strength and joy are literally his dwelling place. Or how about Psalm 95, which says this. Come, let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout aloud to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before him with thanksgiving and extol him with music and song. Why? For the Lord is the great God, the great king above all gods. In his hands are the depths of the earth and the mountain peaks belong to him. The sea is his for he made it and his hands formed the dry land. You want to be great because the God who made you is great. You want to be powerful because the God who called you into existence is powerful. You want to be praised by others because the God who formed you in your mother's womb is worthy to be praised by others. Are you with me? 
He is the great God, the great king above all gods, the scripture says. There is no God like him in heaven above or on earth below. From calling out the galaxy at the beginning to calling each star out by name every night. From parting the Red Sea to walking on the Galilean Sea. From being the author of life to the only one who was strong enough to defeat death. Our God is a great God. And listen closely. You have been made in his image. His greatness, his DNA literally runs through your veins. That is the stock from which you have been made. It's not, wa- it's not wrong to, to, to be great or to want to be great or to want to be the best. It's how you have been hardwired. It's what you were created for. Greatness. But as is the case with most desires, there is a dark side to this one, right? You can go ahead and use your, your best Darth Vader voice at this point. There is a dark side to this desire. Think about this. In trying to find satisfaction to this desire, we tend to look down at others, if not abuse others, so that we can promote and push ourselves. We develop arrogant, ungrateful hearts. We feel as if we always deserve more attention than what the world is showing us. We allow pride and egotism and vanity to dominate our lives because I'm a big deal, darn it. And everybody else should know that. Ask the superstar athlete who gave into performance-enhancing drugs, right? Your desire for greatness can cause you to do some crazy, crazy things. Or for others of us, our desire for greatness manifests itself in a perfectionistic spirit, which nearly always leads to self-criticism, even condemnation. We hear a parent's voice saying something like, why can't you be better at this? Or why can't you be as good at such and such as, as your brother or sister is? We hear these voices beating us up, making us feel anything but great. Are you with me? There's a a dark side to our desire for greatness. If we're not careful, the desire for greatness can leave us feeling anything but. So let's go back to to Gaga's words just for a minute because I think they are profound. We live for the applause. At one level or another, that is true for all of us. The question is, whose? Whose applause are you living for. Are you living for the applause of that pretty girl across the, the room? That, that cute guy? Are you living for the applause of the coach or, or the crowd? Are you living for the applause of, or of the professor? Maybe the, the guidance counselor, the admissions counselor? Because true greatness, eternal greatness is only achieved as you live for the applause of heaven. If you're going to live out Gaga's words, my, go, go ahead. That's what you were created to do. Live for the applause, but make sure it's the correct audience that is applauding. Reminds me of the high school freshman in Oregon who scored the winning basket in the championship basketball game last year. The crowd went wild. Only problem was he scored it for the wrong team. He received a lot of applause, but it's not the kind you want. And is that true for many of us in this life? We're receiving an applause, but it's not the kind that we want. Because you see, the applause of the world, it's, it's relatively easy to get, which means it's also relatively easy to lose. What impresses the crowds is fickle, it's fake, and it's very fleeting. Think about this for a second. If I were to ask you, who won the Super Bowl two years ago, three years ago? I don't know. Who had, you know, who was, who was the, the star of the movie two years ago? Who won, you know, best actor three years ago? Last year, what was the number one hit song? Who was the YouTube sensation, you know, the, the, the biggest, you know, uh, internet sensation recently? I don't know. We, we forget quickly, don't we? We were applauding them so much and so enthusiastically, and then we moved on. Because applause is easy to get, and it's so easy to lose. There's a reason the saying is 15 minutes of fame. Ask any one-hit wonder or child TV star or injured athlete. That's how long it lasts, right? It's 15 minutes, then it's over. A few weeks ago, I had the honor of having lunch with the chaplain for the 49ers. Any 49ers fans? Football? Okay, so this guy's incredible. He was a chaplain for a prison for many years. Now he's chaplain for the 49ers. And I'm sitting there like drooling because I'm a huge football fan. He's telling stories of ministering to Jerry Rice and Terrell Owens late at night. Here's the craziest thing, though, about this guy. He doesn't like football. (laughs) He could care less about the sport. What he actually cares about is that these men are living for their career. That's all they're living for. That is how they have defined greatness. Here's the stat, though, that he shared with me. 
the average NFL player's career lasts three years. So their entire life is built around a three-year definition of greatness. And then after they are done, what happens? The world discards them. The world disregards them, right? And they're not great anymore. And so this man's entire ministry is helping these guys to understand there is a different definition of greatness out there for you. Sure, be great on the field, but understand that you need to be great in so many other areas as well. And I loved that about him. I I still asked for a couple of autographs, but he said no. But that's okay. That's okay. Or take this stupid jacket as an example, right? Take this, take this piece of cloth as an example. Nobody cares anymore that this was true. Maybe I received a few applause when it all happened. It was probably just like my mom, right? That was the only one who was applauding. But nobody cares anymore. And this has literally been in a box in my garage for years. Because the applause is easy to get and it's so easy to lose. It's so fake, it's so fickle, it's so fleeting, Right? If you want to be great, if you want to find true satisfaction to this desire, then you have to seek the applause of the creator, not the crowd. If you want to find the truest satisfaction to this desire, if you want to be great, then you have to seek the applause of your maker, not the masses. If you want to be great, truly great, if you want to find satisfaction to this desire, then you have to seek the applause of heaven, not the applause of those here on the earth. Unlike the applause of this world, if and when you receive the applause of heaven, it will echo for all of eternity. It will never stop. So the question is, what makes heaven applaud? What makes God stand up and say, wow, well well done, well done. Let me show you a verse that that totally blew me away a couple years ago. It's this, Luke 22, beginning in verse 24. Then they, the disciples, began to argue among themselves about who would be the greatest among them. Jesus told them, in this world, the kings and great men lord it over their people, yet they are called friends of the people. But among you, it will be different. Those who are the greatest among you should be the lowest rank, and the leader should be like a servant. Who is more important, the one who sits at the table or the one who serves? Well, it's the one who sits at the table, of course, but not here, for I am among you as one who serves. How many of you have ever heard a group of guys in particular argue over who, like, the greatest quarterback of all time was, right? Or who the greatest basketball player ever was. Maybe it's, like, your grandpa and his friends, the greatest president ever was. Anybody ever been in a situation where they're hearing a bunch of guys argue? If not, like, go on ESPN any time during the day, and guys just arguing, argue, argue, argue. Okay, if you know what that kind of looks like or feels like, first of all, I'm sorry. You kind of wasted time in your life you'll never get back. But secondly, you understand exactly what's happening here in Luke 22. The 12 disciples are in an argument, and guess what the argument's about? Who's the greatest? Who is the greatest amongst them? And wouldn't you know it, Jesus walks up. And I imagine in this moment, the disciples probably felt like a toddler whose mom walked in on them doing something wrong, right? Like, "Eh, nothing, right? Like, put the cat back and put the scissors down, right? Like that kind of thing. I mean, honestly, you would expect in this moment, right, a a rebuke from the Lord. How, How dare you? How dare you, disciples, ask about greatness? How dare you, of all people, talk about who's the best? Are you kidding me right now? I would expect you just to say, you have not learned a single thing if you're talking about who the greatest is among you. That's how I would expect this text to go. But that's not what happens at all, is it? What happens here? There's no reprimand. There's no irritation on Jesus' part. There's no rebuke. Jesus doesn't get mad because the disciples want to be great. He actually affirms the desire. And he says this, oh, you want to be great, do you? (laughs) Of course you do. Well, then let me tell you what that means. Very different response than what we might expect, right? Reminds me of the time when I was stacking wood as a teenager for my dad. Uh, we would get these huge loads of wood in the driveway, and it'd be my responsibility to carry them over to the porch. Well, I thought like stacking the wood just meant moving the pile from the driveway over to the porch. So I just kind of dropped them all over here. It took a couple hours, and I go, and I'm like, Dad, I'm done. He's like, well, I'm going to go check out your work. You know, great, right? So he comes out, 
Are you kidding me right now? That's what he says. So he goes over, he starts to do that. Three pieces this way, then three pieces this way, and three pieces this way. You ever seen a, a stacked pile of wood that's perfectly uniform, straight and easy? I mean, you got to have an advanced mechanical engineering degree to pull this thing off, right? So he finishes the section and he's like, son, that's stacking. And then I kid you not, he says, boom. And then he walks away. I'm like, boom, no, boom, i got to redo it all. But I can't help but wonder if Jesus was saying the exact same thing in this moment when it, when it comes to greatness. You, you call that greatness? You call that greatness. Accomplishments, accumulation of stuff, the applause of the world, you call that greatness? That's not, that's not greatness at all. It's not about power or, or position or your prestige. If you want to be great, Jesus says, you want to be great like God, then you're going to have to become the servant of all. And I imagine he probably said, boom, right after, right? Just for like good measure, like boom. We assume that what makes us great is our superiority over others. We believe that what makes us great is our ability to stand out from others. We think that what makes us great is the fact that we can accomplish more, that we will shine brighter than others. But according to God, the great God of the universe, true greatness has nothing to do with being superior to or standing out from or shining brighter than others. True greatness has everything to do with serving others. Such a different mindset. That's what makes heaven stand up and applaud, is when you serve other people. And I love how on Wednesday, anybody here Wednesday for chapel? We brought kind of like this job guru in for millennials. And he was like, hey, crazy thing, you will find happiness in your job when you what? Serve others. Wow. I think, I think Jesus said that. You will find greatness when you serve others. But it's not just any old kind of service. And this is where some Christians kind of lose their way. You see, in Mark 9, 35, it says this. Sitting down, Jesus called the 12, and he said, anyone who wants to be first must be the very last and the servant of all. The servant of all. That means serving people that we don't know, or maybe worse, people we don't like. That means serving people who can't pay us back or who actually are going to take even more from us after we have serve them. Servant of all means serving children, the elderly, the poor, the marginalized, the sick, the imprisoned, even patriot fans. <laughs> like, I don't want to serve them. I want to punch them, right? But serving others, serving all means serving those on the opposite end of the political spectrum, as well as those on the opposite side of the border or the tracks. You with me? Servant of all means servant of all. This is how most of us spell service, serve us. But you see, there is an I in service because I have been called as a Christian to serve, to serve all. And you have been called to do the same thing. And this would be one thing if Jesus just said this, but he lived it, didn't he? He wasn't just talking the talk, but he walked the walk. Listen to John 13. It says this. Before the Passover celebration, Jesus knew his hour had come to leave the world and return to his Father. He had loved his disciples during his ministry on earth, and now he loved them to the very end. It was time for supper, and the devil had already prompted Judas, son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew the Father had given him authority over everything, and that he had come from God and would return to God. So he got up from the table took off his robe, wrapped a towel around his waist, and poured water into a basin. Then he began to wash the disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that he had around him. I want you to understand what's happening here. The text tells us that literally in this moment, Jesus had authority over everything, which means this. Jesus could do anything he wanted in that moment. His power and prestige were at a pinnacle. Nothing was impossible for him in this moment. Nothing was out of reach. Nothing was beyond his ability. I mean, imagine that. Imagine that right now I said, you could have anything you want. You could do anything you want. You could snap your finger and people would give you or do for you anything you want. Imagine you had that ability. Now stop drooling for a second. Let's think about this. This really happened 
for Jesus, right? But for you, would you make a name for yourself? Would you pamper yourself? Would you hold a press conference and brag about yourself? Would you make a bunch of jackets saying, look at me, I'm so cool? Right? What would you do if you had unlimited authority and power and resources? Would you try to wow the crowds? Would you live in extreme comfort and pleasure? What would you do? In this moment, when Jesus is at his greatest, he picks up, not the letter jacket, but he picks up a towel. He picks up a towel, and he washes undeserving, disgusting feet, even those of his greatest enemy. I highly doubt that given that situation, given that moment, given that opportunity, that I would have made the same choice. I would have chosen the pompous jacket over the lowly towel. It'd be like Aladdin, right? After realizing what he has in the lamp with the genie, like you have three wishes, Aladdin. What do you want to do? I want a basin of water, one. I want a towel, two. And I want to go wash Jafar's feet, three. That's it. Like, are you crazy, man? Right, and I could see Will Smith's character saying that too, right? Like, give me power, give me greatness, give me Princess Jasmine, come on. Give me something, Don't give me a humiliating task to do for somebody I don't like. Yet Jesus shows us that greatness, my friends, is not standing on a podium holding a trophy, bragging about who you are and how much better you are. Greatness is about getting on your knees, holding a towel, helping other people to realize how great they are. You see, God's sovereignty isn't the only thing that makes him great, although doesn't it? God's supremacy isn't the only thing that makes him great. Although, doesn't it? God's strength isn't the only thing that makes him great. Although, doesn't it? What makes God truly great is that he serves. Is that he serves. And what makes us great is that we will follow in his footsteps. We will be just like him. There's a reason the vast majority of the world forgets others and a reason a vast majority of the world never forgets about Jesus because one is truly great and the rest are not so what does this mean for us well that's that's my hope for the rest of this month is that in the month here of October we will talk about greatness and the speakers that we bring in will help us to understand what this means what this looks like for us greatness at the deepest levels at the God level what does it look like and and how do we how do we do it How do we take this day in and day out and become great? So great that one day heaven will applaud. And the applause will echo for all of eternity. That's so much better than winning at Stacker, I think, right? So much better. Let me pray that over you and we'll get you out of here. God, thank you for who you are. And it is true, you are sovereign and you know all things. And so we stand in awe of you for that. It is true that you are stronger than all other gods. You literally spoke and the world came into being. It is true, God, that you you are greater than all other gods, but but it's not necessarily your strength or your your sovereignty, Lord, that makes you so great. It's, It's your servant heart. It's the fact that you would lower yourself to come to us, that you would lower yourself to fix us, that you would lower yourself to save us, that you would come, you would take on flesh, you would lower yourself, humble yourself to become a man, not just any man, but a man who would die on a cross, a humiliating death, so that we may have life, God. You are great, and there is no God like you, but your greatness, Lord, is actually found in your humility. Your greatness is found in your ability to lower yourself and serve others. And we want to follow in your footsteps. The world is all about uh, being over others, being more achieved, more accomplished than others, having more than others. But that's not greatness at all. Greatness is serving others. This is so hard for us to do, God. It doesn't come natural. It doesn't come easy. But would you help us to be great in your eyes? Would we not be like the ones on the TV seeking the applause of the world, but would be like the guy on the corner of of Galleria and and Pleasant Grove or whatever it is, holding a sign that says Jesus loves you. Lord, your definition of greatness is so different than ours. Help us to learn your definition and then to live it out. Make it so now. I pray that over this student group that they would be great, not in the world's eyes, but in your eyes. Make it so. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Grateful for you guys. Have an amazing day, an amazing weekend.